As we continue our series on what it means to be a grace believer, we are going to be touching on things to come for our final session. Of course, this takes us into the area of Christ returns. Not only is he returning for the church, which is his body, commonly known as the rapture, he is also coming again to deliver Israel from the hand of her enemies and from the Antichrist. Now, here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of the future comings of Christ. In regard to the rapture, it is an unprophesied event from the foundation of the world. But when we turn to the second coming of Christ, we learn from the prophetic scriptures that it was foretold since the world began. Then, as we turn to our Lord's return for the church, we see that he's coming as the Lord of glory for us. But in his second coming, he's coming as the judge of all of the earth. Also, the rapture we are to understand is imminent, which means it could take place at any moment. The second coming of Christ is just the opposite. There will be signs and times and seasons that will precede this glorious event. Also, we note that the Lord's return for us is invisible. He is going to return in heaven to catch us away to be with him. On the other hand, the second coming of Christ is his visible return when he stands upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. And finally, we have the judgment seat of Christ that will take place at the rapture of the church. And this pertains to every member of the church, which is his body. But in his second coming, the Lord, as we have seen, is going to return as the judge of all the earth, and he will judge Israel and the nations before he ushers them into the blessings of the coming kingdom. Now here, brethren, we want to pause a moment to present to you a simple timeline. And there's something to be said about simplicity. As we know, we are living under God's mystery program today. He is dispensing the riches of his grace. Therefore, we learn within Paul's epistles that we have a blessed hope, and this dispensation is going to conclude with the rapture of the church. Now, once that trump sounds and we are removed from the earth, then God is going to refer back to his prophetic program. And the prophetic clock will again begin to tick. And God is going to pick up right where he left off at Pentecost and the stoning of Stephen's. And all of the prophetic promises, all of the prophecies that were given by the prophets of old will be fulfilled to the letter. You see, they are all sequential. So once the tribulation period begins, the prophecies are much like a link in a chain that are inseparable, and they will run their course all the way out to the coming kingdom. And so once the church is removed, those who are left behind will go through that dreaded time known as Jacob's trouble. And the next thing on God's calendar of events is the tribulation period once the prophetic clock starts again. And that tribulation period is divided into two parts. We have the first three and a half years that are called tribulation, and the last three and a half years are called the great tribulation, because literally all hell is going to break loose upon the earth. The tribulation period will be brought to a close by the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ 
and then the Lord will set up the throne of his glory and rule and reign in righteousness upon the earth for a 1,000 year period. Now we would like you to turn with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 51 and 52. Here the Apostle Paul writes these words, Behold, I show you a mystery or a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, note here how the Apostle Paul states that the rapture is a mystery or a secret. We find that it cannot be located in the Old Testament scriptures, nor can it be found in the four Gospels. It exclusively is a Pauline truth. And so we want you to be a Berean, though, and study to see if that's the case. You see, we want your faith to rest on the sure foundation of the Word of God rightly divided. Also, note at the end of the passage here that the apostle says, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Here, Paul is referring to our secret resurrection that must be distinguished from the first resurrection in prophecy. The secret resurrection that Paul speaks of here only pertains to the church, the body of Christ. Also, we note, as we come back to verse 51, the apostle says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment of a twinkling of an eye. You see, the dead in Christ shall rise first, but there is one grand generation that is not going to see death. Why, Paul himself had that confident expectation when he first revealed this wonderful truth in the Word of God. But now, 2,000 years later, we still have that confident expectation. As we know, the truth of the rapture was lost for many, many centuries, but it was recovered by a man by the name of J.N. Darby at the end of the late 1800s. Therefore, we see that every generation since Darby has looked forward with great expectation to being that generation that will not see death. Wouldn't it be wonderful, brethren, if that was our generation? And so when the trump sounds, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in a moment of a twinkling of an eye. Also, we want you to note here in this portion that Paul says, At the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Here, we must distinguish between last in the point of time and last in a sequence. So what that means is we have to distinguish between the trump that is spoken of here by the Apostle Paul and the seven trumpets that are spoken of by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. In the coming tribulation period, there are going to be three primary sets of judgments. We have, first of all, the seal judgments, followed by the trumpet judgments, followed by the bowl judgments. As the seventh trumpet is blown in sequence, out of that seventh trumpet comes the seven bowl judgments as the tribulation period continues. Here, though, the Apostle Paul is speaking about a trumpet being sounded as well, but it is the last in a point of time. It is the trump that is going to close out this dispensation of grace as we are ushered in to the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, that the rapture is an unprophesied event. Now, just the opposite was true of the second coming of Christ. 
Here Jude writes these words in verses 14 and 15 of his writing. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. Here we learn that Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam, foretold the second coming of Christ, how he would return to the earth in a flaming fire of vengeance to execute judgment upon his enemies. And so the Holy Spirit takes us all the way back here to the early chapters of Genesis. Then we have the patriarch Job. He too foretold about the Lord's return to the earth. He states in his writing, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that in the latter day he shall stand upon the earth. The other prophets as well, such as Zacharias, spoke of the Lord's return, and the Lord himself confirmed it in the Olivet Discourse to his disciples. And so there is absolutely no question that the Lord's return in his second coming was prophesied from the very beginning. As far as the rapture is concerned, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come as the Lord of glory for the church. You see, we don't know the Lord as the judge of all the earth, thankfully. Rather, we know him as the savior of the world. He's made a provision for all, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you will simply place your faith in the finished work of Christ, that he died for your sins and rose again, you too can have this blessed hope. So when the Lord returns for the church, he's coming back as the God of all grace to receive us unto himself. However, when he comes back for the nation of Israel to regather her, we find from the prophetic scriptures that he's returning as the judge of all of the earth. Note here what the apostle John says in the book of Revelation. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a great white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. It is clear from this passage that the Lord, when he returns in his second coming, is returning as the judge of all of the earth. He's going to come in great power and glory to execute judgment, as we have seen, upon his enemies, those who have oppressed his chosen people. Also, we learn that when he does return, he's going to enter into the valley of Megiddo, where he is going to do battle with the Antichrist and his forces. Isaiah chapter 63 reveals how the Lord will stain his garment, or his garment will be stained in blood. Now, that's not the blood of redemption, but rather the blood that will be sprinkled upon his garments from his enemies. Literally, at that day, the blood is going to run as high as the horse's bridle. And so here then we see that the Lord is returning as the judge of all of the earth at the close of the tribulation period. As we move on, we learn that the rapture of the church is imminent. And what we mean by that is that it could take place at any moment. Do you realize before we complete this study, we could be standing in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? There are no signs or times or seasons that are going to precede this glorious event. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. One thing we learn from the Pauline epistles is this. 
is that the rapture is going to take place before God pours out his wrath on this Christ-rejecting world. That's known as the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Now, to teach anything otherwise than that is to confuse the two programs of God. We are promised deliverance from the wrath to come. And those who are left behind will have to go through that dreaded tribulation period as they experience the wrath and judgment of God. And so the rapture of the church then is imminent. It could take place at any moment. And one thing we know is this, that it's 2,000 years closer than it was when Paul first revealed it in his epistles. As we turn to the second coming of Christ, we learn that it will be preceded by signs and times and seasons. Here in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29, we read these words. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Matthew says, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Note that Matthew says here, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So as we come out to the close of the tribulation period, they will be able in that day to look up, and the sun will be darkened and the moon will be turned to blood, and the stars will fall from the heavens, and the foundations of the heavens and the earth will be shaken. And at that point, the Lord said to his disciples to look up, because your redemption is drawing near. It is clear then that there will be miraculous manifestations when Christ returns to the earth. Also, we know that this coming is going to take place in one of the night time watches. We know that because of the parable of the ten virgins and other related passages. Also, the second coming of Christ is going to take place in the fall of the year. We know this from the Levitical offerings which speak about the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first four Levitical feasts have already been fulfilled, but there are three yet remaining, all three of which take place in the fall of the year. So when we consider the second coming of Christ then, it is associated with signs, times, and seasons. As far as the rapture of the church, it is the invisible return of Christ. It makes up that body of truth we call the secret coming. Now that brings us over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. Here the Apostle Paul was writing to the saints at Thessalonica, and he shares this with them and us. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Uh, we want you to note here that the Lord, when he comes for the church, is going to bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. Uh, we want to be very clear here that Paul is not speaking about soul sleep. Soul sleep is taught nowhere in the word of God. That is rather the teaching of the cults. When you see phraseology such as in this context to be asleep in Jesus, it's referring to the physical body that is laid into the dust of the earth. It has the appearance of being asleep. And when the Lord comes for the church, he is going to bring those who have preceded us in death back with him and raise their bodies from the earth, reunite their soul and spirits, and give them a glorified resurrected body. Now, what I want you to see from this passage is this, that the terms of salvation spoken of here by the Apostle Paul, that Jesus died and rose again, 
limit the secret coming of Christ only to those who are members of the true church, the church, the body of Christ. So from the conversion of Paul until the last one placed into the body, which could take place at this hour, only those are a part of this upward calling that we know as the secret coming of Christ. Because you see, only Paul taught those terms of salvation for the dispensation of grace. Therefore, it limits only those saved in this dispensation to be a part of the rapture of the church. Also, we go on in verse 16 to read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. Here we want you to see that the Lord is going to descend out of the third heaven into the first heaven. That's our atmosphere. If you've ever flown, as you go up about 30,000 feet, you'll see a cloud cover, and as you come up through the clouds, uh, it just looks like you could step out of the plane and walk right out into heaven. Well, that's where the Lord's going to descend to. And then we, the members of the body of Christ, are going to be caught off of the earth into his glorious presence. And there we will see him face to face in all of his glory. So it is very clear here from this portion of scripture that the church is removed from the earth and caught in to heaven. Now, oftentimes I am asked where this term rapture came from. The brethren read the scriptures and study Paul's epistles, and they say, I've never seen that term in the word of God. Well, if you drop down to verse 17, we read these words. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I call your attention to those two little words, caught up. In the Greek language, that is the Greek word harpazo, and it has the idea to catch away or to snatch away. Whenever we study that Greek word as it's translated into Latin, the Latin translation of it is rapto. And so what theologians have done over the years, they coined the term rapture on the basis of that Latin translation. And so from this portion of scripture then, we learn that the Lord is coming in his secret coming. He's going to remain in the first heaven and be invisible to all of those who are upon the earth. But when we turn to the second coming of Christ, just the opposite is true. We learn here in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4 this, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So when the Lord comes back in his second coming, he's coming back visibly. He's going to actually return to the earth, and the sole of his feet will rest upon the Mount of Olives. You will recall when our Lord ascended back to heaven that the disciples were standing there that day, and they watched him be received into a cloud and out of their sight, and they couldn't believe their eyes. And they stood there gazing up, and suddenly there were two angels who appeared, and they said to them, Why do you stand here gazing up? Don't you know that the Lord is going to return in like manner? In other words, he went out of their sight visibly in power and great glory. He's going to return in his second coming visibly and in power and great glory. The Apostle John confirms this as well in the book of Revelation. He states, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. 
in that day when they look up they'll see the son of man coming in great power and glory and as he returns he's coming with his angelic host and all of the prophetic saints who are returning with him to be raised in the first resurrection it will be such an ominous sight that literally the inhabitants of the earth will tremble as Christ returns to execute judgment upon the enemies of Israel, as he returns to gather his people like a flock of chickens that he might bring them into the glories of the kingdom. So the Lord's second coming, brethren, is his visible return to the earth. Finally, that brings us to the judgment seat of Christ, which will take place at the rapture of the church. Sometimes this is called the believer's judgment. Paul makes reference to it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or of no value, is the sense of the passage. Here, as we consider the judgment seat of Christ, sin is not the issue. The sin question has already been answered for us at Calvary. We are forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. Interestingly, in Paul's epistles, forgiveness is always in the past tense. Rather, the apostle is speaking about our service and conduct. At the judgment seat of Christ, our entire Christian life is going to be reviewed by the Lord. And we're going to have to give an answer concerning those things which have been done in his body, whether they be good or, or of no value. Have we faithfully witnessed for the cause of Christ? Have we made all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? You see, we are going to be judged according to the Pauline epistles because Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And so when we turn to his epistles, we have the will of God for the church today and we will be judged accordingly. And so at the judgment seat of Christ, it will be a complete review of our Christian life. As we turn to the second coming of Christ, Christ is going to judge Israel and the nations upon the earth. He will cause Israel to pass under the law and separate the believers from the unbelievers. And the believers who have been faithful unto him, he will usher them into the blessings of the kingdom. That will be true of the nations as well that will stand before the throne of his glory at that day. He will separate the sheep nations from the goat nations. Those who have believed on him as Messiah, they too will enjoy the blessings of the kingdom, while the goat nations who oppressed Israel will be cast into outer darkness. Well, brethren, that brings us to the conclusion of our study. It is a privilege to know the revelation of the mystery, but with it comes the responsibility to make it known. But sadly, many refuse to take a stand for it. They have counted the cost, and the cost was simply too high for them. You know, I had the privilege of knowing and working with Pastor Stam for many, many years. And he said to me one time, Brother Paul, isn't it sad that all too many are willing to put the truth on ice? And I have found that to be true in my experience as well. There are all too willing to sacrifice the truth on the altar of compromise. But that's where you're to be commended for opening the scriptures and studying the word rightly divided. Because as we study Paul's apostleship and message, this is God's will for the church today. Shall we apologize for God's will? I think not. 
how grateful we should be to have a fuller knowledge of God's will. And it is by the grace of God we pray on your behalf that you'll make a practical application of these things in your Christian life. Well, brethren, as we close our series of messages on what it means to be a grace believer, we want to thank you for your kind attention, and may God's very best be yours in Christ Jesus.